All right. I wanted to talk about something to start off talking this morning about something that is still bothering me. And I will tell you that most of the stuff that, I, that I'm going to talk about this morning is all based on things that are just like, this was bugging me. And so I want to say something about it. Um, <clears throat> I've given this talk before, and you may have actually seen it if you've uh, uh, hung out with me uh, previously, or if you've come to a, a talk or something like that. I may have even I may have even given this talk in EMS Grand Rounds before, but I haven't recorded it uh, and it's not up, so I feel like I need to go ahead and say it. <clears throat> um, but this is also spurred by recent, uh, a couple of recent uh, runs I've looked at, a couple of recent cases I've seen brought into an emergency department. End title CO2. This has been out there for years. Now, when I was a medical student, I was doing, I, I did a lab medicine rotation, which is the weirdest thing in the world. But, uh, but I was talking to the um, guy that does that was basically the doctor, the medical director for the lab. And uh, he was talking about like, well, you got to pick some test that's interesting on and do a report on it. I don't know, it was like the end of fourth year, do some sort of bullshit thing, I don't care. Um, so I picked uh, uh, carbon dioxide monitoring as a, a detector of sepsis. And it was fascinating because that, that was like 2009, something like that. Uh, and he was fascinated by the idea that there is actually entitled CO2 monitoring that about appropriate uh, equilibrates to um, monitoring. Sorry, another person coming in uh, to the monitoring that you might get on a blood gas. And that was just a fascinating thing. But entitled CO2 monitoring in airways and uh, advanced airways and in the ICU was was not new at that point. It had been around for years. Um, but it was just sort of gaining steam a little bit. Now we've had that's that's been a dozen years or so, uh, and we should have universal adoption of this for the reasons that I'll show you in a minute. But we still do not. And many of us would have thought this was standard of care uh, again nine years ago when I actually got out of residency, started doing an actual like doctor thing. Um, this should have been standard of care then, um, and yet for some reason we still see tubes brought in without entitled CO2 on the end of it. We still see patients that are put at risk by not using uh, waveform and tidal CO2. And I would venture to say that this measuring, uh, that this modality is available for everybody that is out there on pretty much any monitor. If you're uh, managing an airway, you've got to have end tidal CO2 and it's got to be waveform and tidal CO2. Let's talk about it a little bit. First of all, I don't own any stake in uh, Entitled CO2 companies or anything like that. Uh, Zoll, come looking my way if you uh, want to change that. All right. Um, the first thing that got me started on this, or, or not really got me started, but I thought was a, a very illustrative example of why Entitled CO2 is so freaking important, uh, was this article. And I think this is, I can't remember where this is from. This may be from like GEMS or something like that. Uh, EMS one or one, one of the websites, but it, it was an interesting story, whatever you think of the, the publication. Um, it was, was an interesting story. So this is a young kid. Uh, he's like 13 years old, something like that. Um, got involved in a minor skateboarding accident, fell, hit his head, had some concussion type symptoms. Um, really was like awake talking, maybe just, uh, you know, I'm imagining some like repetitive questioning, but was definitely not comatose or anything like that. So he was taken to a local emergency room. They checked him out. Uh, as I recall, scanned his head. Everything looked okay, but he it was still pretty wacky. So they decided they needed to send him to a pediatric um, trauma center so that they could get him evaluated by uh, a neurosurgeon or neurospecialist. Okay, fine. Um, however, somewhere along the way, somebody decided that before he needed to go, that he needed to be intubated for concern that he may not be able to protect his airway during the transit. No, who knows why, but it was what happened. So he got intubated. No problem. He goes on down the road. Uh, maybe 30 minutes, 20 minutes from the trauma center, a uh, patient starts to wake up. And he becomes, as people do, buck wild and uh, thrashes around, moving around. <clears throat> the crew ends up re-paralyzing him uh, and uh, resedating him and takes him on to the, uh, to the hospital. En route, uh, he begins to become unstable and then goes into cardiac arrest. And he's eventually resuscitated by the uh, receiving hospital crew who finds out that his tube uh, is quite clearly in the esophagus. And that almost certainly happened when he uh, self-extubated as he was thrashing around. But he was able to survive, as many people are, young, healthy lungs. You're able to oxygenate for, you know, minutes and minutes and minutes at a time, um, <clears throat> even without a lot of uh, spontaneous ventilation. But at the point uh, where he moved around, he probably uh, uh, pulled the tube, unfortunately. And, and he ended up uh, uh, eventually dying, as, as I recall. So absolutely terrible, you know, lots of stuff that, that went wrong, and yes, a bunch of Swiss cheese, but um, there was no end tidal CO2 monitoring on the tube at the time. 
And I would say almost without a doubt that if that had been done correctly, that this kid would still be alive. Um, and it is essentially the thing that, uh, that would have told you before anything else, before anything bad had happened to this child, if you'd used it, if you'd looked at it, and I don't mean to second guess these guys, but goddamn, this is a terrible story. Um, if you had done that, then he would, you would have recognized the misplaced tube and he would still be alive and it would be no big deal. He probably would have just woken up actually. Um, <clears throat> but that's, that's the way it is. That's what happens. But this is a great reason why you've got to watch out for tube placement, why we have to have constant monitoring of our ET, or sorry, constant ETCO2 monitoring of our endotracheal tubes. Uh, because even if you get in the right spot to start with, you got to make sure it stays in the right spot. I'll get into that a little bit more here. Um, <clears throat> just as an FYI, the more you look back into this, the more you kind of find out that, uh, you know, the gold standard, this is from um, uh, Corey Slovis and uh, Stephen White, uh, the more you look into it, the gold standard, I saw the tube go through the cords, even that is not really good enough uh, to say that the tube not only it remains in the right spot, but landed in the right spot uh, and is exchanging gas. Uh, and so even our gold standard for confirming intubation is not good enough. We need to have something else and that something else is entitled CO2. Uh, and this is, a, this is a good commentary. It's from a couple of years ago, but it's, it's still pretty good to read. CO2, where do you get CO2 from in your body? Well, uh, I am no biochemistry major, but you take glucose and um, combine it with oxygen and your cells do some things and then you generate ATP and CO2 as a byproduct. There's some other ways you get CO2 as well. How do you get rid of that CO2? The ATP we like, we gotta get rid of the CO2. Uh, you get rid of CO2, <clears throat> um, this is a close-up of an alveolus. Blood going past your alveoli will go that way. O2 will passively diffuse in until it reaches the, concentra the same concentration as here, and CO2 will passively diffuse out uh, until the, uh, either the blood goes completely past the alveolus or until the concentration of CO2 here is about the same concentration of CO2 in the blood or the same partial pressure. Uh, so it diffuses out into the alveolus and that eventually goes up into the airways and it goes outside uh, into the lungs or into an end tidal CO2 detector or where wherever it is it's gonna go. So if you look at the lungs itself, once you get it into the airways, uh, how do you get the CO2 out? Well, you blow it out, you passively exhale it or whatever it is you're going to do. If you want to measure end tidal CO2, and this is a little bit of an important thing uh, just, to, just to say, uh, because you got to understand where the waveform comes from. If you're going to measure it, what you do is you put a sensor right at the top of the airway. Maybe that's on your nose and your mouth. Uh, maybe that's on the end of the, uh, the eye gel or the ET tube, whatever it is. Um, and then you start blowing past it. So here's an end tidal CO2 waveform. Everybody's probably seen this because again, at least in Kentucky, but probably everywhere, end tidal CO2 monitoring is a BLS skill. So there, there's no reason that pretty much anybody that would be on an ambulance can't do this and doesn't at least have a little bit of an idea of what's going on. Let's look at the parts real quick. So <clears throat> we start at rest <sighs> here. Um, <clears throat> take a breath, blow it out. <sighs> Air moves past that sensor. So pretend I've got a thing in front of my face. Um, <clears throat> when we're at rest here, we look something like that. The level of CO2, basically the uh, CO2 sensor is sensing air at that point, room air, which has a, a low concentration of CO2. It's not zero, but it's very low. Um, so you start off at a baseline of approximately zero. When uh, <clears throat> uh, I take, or this is, um, I have blown out here. Um, when you blow out here, you generate this curve, um, this little thingy right here, this first uh, you know, phase of the end tidal CO2 waveform. What is this? This is me inhaling. This is me starting here at zero, and then I blow out CO2 until it reaches essentially a constant concentration as it goes past the sensor. So from here to here, all this green part, this is me exhaling because I'm blowing the CO2 out past that sensor uh, and the sensor's picking it up. Now that concentration stays that way as long as CO2 is in front of that sensor. How do you get the CO2 to go away from that sensor? You take a breath in, did that, and I inhale. And when I inhale, I inhale probably fresh gas or at least CO2, that, or at least gas that doesn't have a lot of CO2 in front of it, and so the concentration goes down. And so what the sensor is seeing right here is just again, uh, room air, or whatever inhaled gas that I'm breathing, but probably low concentration of CO2. And then I'll repeat the process. Uh, I'm in here and I blow out and in here and blow out. 
And that's essentially the way that end tidal CO2 monitoring creates a waveform. That is what you're actually seeing. So when you are seeing a waveform, what you're seeing is gas being blown out of the, uh, out of the lungs, out of the airways, uh, and being picked up by that sensor. So an end tidal CO2 wave is a sign that gas, that uh, CO2, has made it outside uh, of the, made it from the blood, essentially through all the different steps it has to take and then has gotten to that sensor. Now there's a lot of things that get in the way of that potentially happening, uh, and any one of them could cause perturbations in the way that you measure CO2 or the, the measurement that you get, uh, but that is what it actually is showing. It's, it's not saying necessarily when you put it on that the tube is in the right spot. What it is saying is that uh, you are getting gas exchange from the alveoli out to the sensor itself. All right, important to go over that because almost nobody says it and everybody just kind of assumes everybody knows where this comes from. So let's get into the actual meat and the use of the thing. Uh, N-tidal CO2, waveform N-tidal CO2 needs to go on every tube, every time, every mask, every eye gel, every, God, if you have a combi tube still, um, one of those things, everything that you put uh, and help the patient to breathe through needs an N-tidal CO2 monitor for it and needs to be waveform, it needs to be continuous. <clears throat> there should be no device that you have stuck in the patient's mouth that does not have uh, these, uh, does not look like this at the top. In fact, I would say that you are missing a critical portion. You are, I would go so far as to say you are wrong if your tube doesn't look like this at the top. It should be attached to the top of every single tube except different, you know, monitors are a little bit funny that way sometimes. But uh, there should be an entitled CO2 mon uh, capture device of one kind or another at the end of every tube. And if the tube doesn't look like that, something is wrong, look at it and say, oh my God, I gotta go back and fix it. You don't know the tube is in place, you don't, or your biad or whatever it is. You don't know the thing is in place until you see the more or less square waveform come up uh, on the entitled CO2 monitor. And the the you know risk of saying oh well the thing is malfunctioning or I don't know why I'm not getting entitled CO2 come back out of there the risk of doing that uh, and causing grievous harm to the patient is so great that <clears throat> we cannot assume that that is the case so if you don't have uh, a, a, at least some sort of waveform some sort of wave uh, that shows up <clears throat> and it looks more or less square and more or less correlates with your breathing rate uh, or the rate that with with which you are bagging then your tube is not in the right spot. And that's really what you have to assume every single time. Now you may say, well, there's other ways to do it. What about this thing? This is entitled CO2. Yeah, it is. Uh, the little color metric thing, that's nice, that's cute. Uh, <clears throat> the problem is entitled CO2 gives you a number and a waveform, both of which are important in calculating how, or in figuring out if the tube's in the right spot and how you're breathing for the person. And there's really not a good reason why you would pick this, which is an inferior product, uh, compared to waveform entitled CO2 monitoring. If you had to have this in a pinch, yes, people do it. I still occasionally see it thrown on the end of a uh, tube. Fine, if you want to do it, but as long as you have n tidal CO2 with it and you can see the waveform, then I'm fine with using it. <clears throat> if you don't have waveform n tidal CO2 with it, then you need to get rid of this thing and you need to get n tidal uh, CO2 monitoring with a waveform on there because the thing is not in the right spot till you see that wave. Um, here you have no number, no waveform, and these things are relatively easy to fool. They get contaminated. It's just a color. Uh, it really doesn't give you any more information about it. So ditch this thing. Just get your, your waveform and title CO2 out. What about other ways to maybe conform, confirm a tube? You know, uh, they teach us all different kinds of stuff. We always say uh, equal breath sounds, right? You check the breath sounds, uh, that means the tubes, you know, gas going in and out, that kind of stuff, it's making noise. Sure, the problem is that uh, when you have misplaced tubes, you get equal breath sounds documented 95% of the time. So 95% of the time when you looked at somebody who had a misplaced ET tube, somebody said, oh yeah, he has equal breath sounds. The tube is clearly unrecognized and misplaced, but they still said he's got equal breath sounds. So either we suck at listening to breath sounds or breath sounds are no good, uh, and it's maybe a combination of the two, but it, either way, bad test for figuring out if, uh, if the tube is in the right spot. And this is not just pre-hospital, uh, pre mind you. This is in the ED, this is in the ICU, uh, this is floor codes, all this stuff. Everybody sucks at breath sounds or at least using them to figure out if the tube is actually in the right spot because there's so much stuff that can sound like uh, bilateral breath sounds. So bilateral breath sounds, not good enough. Other stuff, well, what about fog in the tube? You know, fog in the tube, theoretically, that's moist air coming back out. Cool air goes in, cools the tube down. Fog in the tube comes back up. You get condensation, right? Uh, fog in the tube noted in 80, 5% of the misplaced tubes. Guess what? You have uh, <clears throat> moist air in your stomach when you uh, breathe through it. When you squeeze a bag in there and then some air comes back out through your esophagus, uh, that air also gets fog in the tube. Not good enough. Uh, definitely not good enough to risk my life on uh, or anybody else's.
What about the gold standard again? I saw it go through the chords. You would think, okay, that's definitely it. This is, you, you cannot do any better than that, right? Saw the tube go through the cord was documented in 52% of misplaced tubes. So 50% of the time, when somebody had a misplaced tube, they said they saw it go through the cords. And this is not that hard to, to really kind of understand. You know, when you look at this, you would say, well, that's a grade one view. You know, I can see the whole thing. Uh, not only is it, uh, not only can I see it all, it's nice and big. Uh, you know, I could drive a Mack truck through there. I see the tube sitting in there right now. Of course, I'm in the right spot. The problem is, that's not the trachea. That's not the glottis. Glottis is up here. That's the esophagus. When you grab and pull the laryngeal structures up, if you stretch the uh, bottom part of the, or, uh, of the pharynx, you can make it look a lot like a glottis. And that's sort of a problem because you would be looking in there saying, I see the damn thing in the, uh, through, going through the cords. If you do that, the next question, of course, be, well, well, then where's the esophagus? Oh, it's that thing up top. Oh, shit. Sorry, excuse my language. <clears throat> but, um, but that's kind of the way I feel about it. So going through, seeing it go through the cords, good. Absolutely critical, not good enough to say it's still in the right spot though. <coughs> I thought I would mention the turkey bulb. This is an interesting idea, uh, but if you are using this as your, your way of actually confirming, uh, confirming tube placement at this point, um, well, I, I see it in a lot of training stuff, but uh, hopefully nobody's doing this still. Not, definitely not good enough. This just relies on the idea that uh, you could suck the esophagus into the bulb and it would uh, keep the thing from reinflating. If you're, again, relying on that as the marker of whether or not this kid that you're intubating is going to live or die, uh, then we probably need to talk. <clears throat> One last thing, uh, even if you see the ET tube pass through the cords, uh, there's no guarantee it's going to stay there. Balloons get torn, balloons rip, uh, things get pulled out, kids wake up and get buck wild and uh, grab at their tube, old men get, wake up and get buck wild and grab at their tube, 37-year-old men wake up and get buck wild and grab at their tube. If you don't have entitled CO2 monitoring, you don't know that the tube is still in the right spot. So even if it was in the right spot in the beginning, if you can't guarantee that it stays there, then that's a problem for you. And again, this is a life-risking uh, issue. <clears throat> so we have to have it for continued monitoring. If you don't have an entitled CO2 waveform, uh, maybe it's that you didn't put it on, maybe it's that the tube is out, maybe it's that the tube is kinked or something like that. But if you don't have the waveform in place, the tube is not in the right spot, the tube is non-functional, you have to address it immediately. Overall, if I haven't made the case so far, uh, this, is, this is that kid, uh, and this, is not a, this was available just on the internet and part of that article, so it's not creepy or anything, but that is this kid. Uh, and this kid is not alive today, but probably would be, almost certainly would be, uh, if entitled CO2 monitoring, waveform entitled CO2 monitoring had been used uh, during his care. <clears throat> Simple fact is that in general, we get about 23.8% misplaced ET tubes uh, without using entitled CO2 monitoring. So one out of four tubes are in the wrong spot uh, and are not recognized if you don't have entitled CO2, at least not immediately recognized. That number drops to zero if you have waveform entitled CO2 monitoring. So it never happens if you have waveform entitled CO2 monitoring, and it's not that it never happens, but it's exceedingly rare um, if you have that square waveform, uh, and it happens about a quarter of the time otherwise. So you have to use entitled CO2 monitoring. And again, if you don't see the waveform, if it's not there, if it goes away, something has happened, that tube has gone into the wrong spot. Maybe it's not your fault, but we got to fix it. And you may even say, well, what if they go into cardiac arrest? Just as an FYI, if you get the tube in the right spot, it's going to generate some entitled CO2. This is a graph of entitled CO2 monitored uh, after a, uh, a fresh cadaver was taken. And <clears throat> uh, basically, fresh cadaver, uh, two days ago, they took him, refrigerated him, uh, got him back out. An hour later, they intubated him and started squeezing through this dead person's uh, lungs. And what did you find? that they generate entitled CO2. And, and they don't generate a lot of it, but they generate a consistent waveform. It's definitely there. You know, this ends up between like five, uh, five to 10, something like that would be the reading on the, uh, on the monitor. Even more interesting, when you start doing CO2 on that 36-year-old refrigerated corpse, you generate more entitled CO2. So it is, it is there. Uh, it is 100% there every time uh, if the tube's in the right spot, as long as you're getting gas exchanging from the blood to the air. And if you say there is no way in hell that's true, well, here's the proof. Here is a cadaver intubated. This guy is, again, clearly dead for some time. And as you ventilate, you will see that you are generating an entitled CO2. Not much, four or five, something like that, but it's there. 
So if the tube is in the right spot, and if the tube is unobstructed, you should get CO2 coming back, unless there's something really weird that happened. We'll talk about a little bit of that. I'm dwelling on this a little bit much, and I apologize for that, but damn, this is really important, and I can't believe we're still not doing it. Uh, of the laws that uh, uh, affect things in, in medicine, air goes in and out, blood goes round and round, and if you don't have a square or at least a somewhat square uh, end tidal CO2 waveform, the tube is in the wrong spot and you cannot afford to assume anything other than that. So make that happen. It's probably important to learn a little bit uh, about what the waveform means as we are all uh, <clears throat> providers and we're the expectation of, uh, of all of us, including our, you know, from the very basic level, the person that has just uh, graduated from, uh, from your EMT program uh, with no further training and no time on the street, you are expected to know what the end tidal CO2 waveform means because monitoring is within your scope of practice. Uh, so that should be something that you are familiar with. Let's talk about them real quick. Uh, most of us have seen these before. Here is a waveform at the bottom. You see that nice uh, square wave. It's got shoulders here and here. Uh, and again, this is, I'm exhaling here, or sorry, this is uh, inhalation, fresh air drawn, exhaling here, another breath in here. That's the way that works. That's what a typical waveform looks like. Most of the time you're gonna see something like that. What may make it different? Well, you've probably seen little bits of this one. What's different about what I'm showing now versus the, the square waveform that you see going through there? You notice that you don't have that nice sharp corner up here. You see one here where the patient starts to take a breath in, but this is somewhat, uh, you know, it's blunted a little bit. That number is not going immediately up to whatever its baseline is, you know, 40 or something like that. It takes a little bit to sort of ramp up to it. And we can do that in a more extreme form here uh, in just a second. You gotta think to yourself, when I'm looking at this, what would make that do that? What would say, if, this, if that first part is exhalation, what would slow down your ability to exhale CO2? What is it that's blocking that? Uh, and uh, of course the answer is, as we've probably seen, and you probably just know this, this is the shark fin that people talk about. This is obstructive lung disease. So normal here, uh, obstructive lung disease here. <sighs> blowing out. Um, <clears throat> here, remember uh, COPD and asthma, the big problem is that you can't exhale effectively. And so you take a minute to actually blow, start blowing out enough uh, CO2 to reach your steady state. Maybe you don't ever entirely get it completely blown out, actually. Um, but that is, that's the classic uh, shark fin, that's obstructive lung disease. Uh, there's a couple other sort of important ones that you might see. Whoops. Um, this one, we're going along, breathe in, and let's see, breathe out, breathe in, and you're expecting at some point to see the uh, number kind of go back up there and the waveform go back up, right? What happened here? This, uh, everybody has to recognize, of course, because suddenly we went from having a nice square wave uh, to nothing. It, one of two things has happened. Either the patient has completely died and is no longer generating any sort of CO2, which doesn't happen. Even if you go into cardiac arrest, you still have to blow out all that CO2. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that happens is the tube gets lost, obstructed, uh, kinked, whatever it is. You're no longer getting uh, CO2 back out of the tube. Tube is in the wrong spot if you see this. Either they went into some sort of terrible cardiac arrest that is really weird or uh, tube's in the wrong spot. Almost certainly the tube's in the wrong spot and they're about to go into cardiac arrest unless you save them. How about this guy? Uh, the difference here, note that the waveform itself looks pretty much okay, but it never comes back down to zero. This is somebody that may be getting, it's called rebreathing. Basically, you never clear the gas out of the tube itself. Uh, so this is somebody that may be taking like little tiny shallow breaths or uh, something like that. Um, and you'll more, more often than not see this in like somebody that's hyperventilating. Um, and then this is an important thing here. Uh, you'll note this is kind of a funky waveform, right? There's this little sawtoothy thing here and a little sawtoothy thing here, but we're not getting the square waveform. And this is why it's important to say you, you can still generate a number. You know, the, the entire CO2 that we're getting here, 16, 17, you can still generate a number, but if you're not seeing a waveform, uh, tube is still in the wrong spot. This uh, person actually was undergoing CPR. So each of these little uh, bumps, each of these little sawtooths are at a rate of about 100, which is what a Lucas pushes at. Um, but you never actually get the waveform back. That's because the tube, while it may have been in the right spot to start with, was unrecognized to have fallen out of the glottis and sitting back in the back of the oropharynx. So every time you get a little, you know, breath from the lung, from the Lucas pushing in, it goes, 
and blows past the tube, but doesn't actually blow through the tube. So again, if you're not getting an end tidal CO2 waveform that is appropriate, uh, the tube is not in the right spot. You got to correct that. Even if you get a number, uh, the number in itself is not okay. You got to see the wave. Those are the, probably the two big important things. And if you were to just kind of walk away right now, like I'd be okay with that. There's a few other things we can do with end tidal CO2 though that may make it a little bit more sexy and may make you want to use it more. Um, <clears throat> You should know a little bit about what your entitled CO2 is supposed to be and what's okay to change with it, when it might be okay to try to manipulate that parameter. So normal entitled CO2, somewhere between 35 and 45, uh, and we're generally gonna target our ventilations, assuming we're doing assisted ventilation, something like that. Now, spontaneously breathing patient, different story, but let's talk about the guy that's intubated, and we'll even say he's paralyzed. The times when you might change that. Well, number one, in severe head trauma, um, <clears throat> you get uh, increased ICP because of swelling, because of hemorrhage, or maybe because of a mass or something like that. Uh, maybe it's because you're obstructing fluid. If you get increased intracranial pressure, uh, without doing a surgery, there's basically three things that you can try to do to, uh, to decrease the pressure inside the brain and keep it from getting squished against the, the hard skull. Um, one is that you can take down the size of the brain tissue itself, which again is a surgery. Uh, number two, you can try to remove CSF, which requires a neurosurgeon because you got to put a hole in the top of the guy's head and drain that stuff out. Uh, number three, the third thing that's sitting in there is blood volume. Uh, and so if you decrease the volume of blood in the head, then intracranial pressure should go down. You put a little bit less pressure on the brain and they stop squishing quite so much. And that's the idea behind this mild hyperventilation that we see for, uh, for herniation. And this is not just a head injured person. This is not, you know, he's got to bleed. He's got a subarachnoid, something like that. This is if the patient is herniating. If they have so much pressure in their head that it is forcing their brain out through the little hole uh, through the frame and magnum at the bottom of their skull. Um, and in that case, we're going to do mild hyperventilation with a targeted end tidal CO2 between 30 and 35 rather than the 35 to 45. And of course, this is, again, only for herniation. This is for folks that are comatose because you really can't herniate and be, you know, awake. Either comatose and have a blown pupil or two blown pupils uh, or comatose and are posturing, uh, doing, you know, this thing when you stimulate them or doing that thing when you stimulate them. <clears throat> um, those are the indications for mild end tidal CO2 or uh, mild reduction in tidal CO2. And again, we go between 30 and 35. What's the problem with that? The problem is that that relies on your uh, brain to have less blood flow. And you can actually demonstrate this, this brain on the right, this was a uh, MRI scan. So when you're breathing normally, the, the bright stuff is uh, blood flow and the brighter, the, the better flow. Uh, if you hyperventilate for a minute, you can see that everything's gone from pretty white to pretty red. Uh, or pretty purple, which means that you have a lot of area of brain that's not getting uh, really good blood flow. So you can imagine you now have an injured brain or a stroked brain uh, that is getting limited blood flow to it. And you can imagine the brain doesn't like that a whole awful lot. And you don't want to do it unless you really have to. Uh, this is a temporary measure, if anything, but you don't want to do it on most people, uh, especially if they just got a little knock on the head. Um, you shouldn't be trying to hyperventilate these guys. Again, it's a comatose and they probably need to be either posturing or have a blown pupil. Um, or signs of obvious herniation, those may be the indications for it. But that's a good use of entitled CO2. Now, something else that's sort of uh, important here uh, to keep in mind, especially if you're doing like uh, big, big inner facility transports from like a receiving hospital, you know, a small, smaller receiving hospital uh, to like a trauma center or something like that. Let's look at this guy. He is uh, on a motorcycle. He has terrible fractures. His legs are mangled up. You see, he's got the injuries you see here. He's also got, you know, significant head injury. He got intubated uh, by you and you didn't use, need to use any drugs. He was pretty loose. It was GCS3. You just slid the tube on in there, uh, no problem. But he is spontaneously breathing uh, at this point. You get him on the monitor. You've confirmed that he has a waveform and we think, okay, cool. And you look a little deeper at it, there's a good waveform. You can see that he is tachycardic. Uh, he's hypotensive in the 80s. <clears throat> Sad is okay, good. And he's got uh, entitled CO2 uh, monitoring at the bottom. And it does have a waveform, but his number is only 11. And you may say to yourself, wait a minute, um, that's bad. You know, blood flow to brain, uh, if it is low, if their entitled CO2 could be low. So we probably need to uh, slow his breathing down. So I'm going to give him a big slug of fentanyl. Or if you have a paralytic, I'm going to give him a paralytic or something like this. Um, <clears throat> because I want that entitled CO2 to go up. So I got to bring his uh, breathing rate down. And uh, then that number will go up and, uh, and, and it'll look better and it'll be within goal. Okay, cool. There's a problem with that though. Um, when you take control of somebody's respirations, you really got to know what's going on inside the body. Uh, and your acid-base balance is a really big deal and really hard to figure out just from entitled CO2 monitoring. 
So <clears throat> um, you have cells and they're constantly creating acid, uh, sometimes in the form of like dissolved CO2 as byproducts of their random, uh, of, uh, respiration and that sort of stuff. Cells are constantly creating acid uh, as they swim around. However, your body is constantly getting rid of that acid as well, and that's a normal thing. Uh, your body is always making stuff, your body's always getting rid of stuff. The way that it gets rid of the acid is this way. And let's go through each of these steps in detail. Yeah, I'm just kidding, that's a, that's a bad joke. Um, <clears throat> a couple of things to remember about how your body gets rid of acid. It, you can break it down thusly. Um, you create acid just by living. Your body has figured out a way to get rid of it. Basically, your lungs will blow off CO2 and your kidneys make bicarbonate. So your kid, if you think about it this way, your body makes vinegar, uh, your kidneys create baking soda. When you throw the vinegar and the baking soda together, what normally happens? Anybody who's uh, tried this thing with like a pop bottle, you know, put it together, put a cork in the top and go. That was really unimpressive. That's better. <clears throat> um, what happens is when you mix them together, uh, the pH sort of normalizes, and as a result, you get CO2 released. That pop bottle, that cork popping off in your body, and this is the exact same process, happens by your lungs getting rid of CO2. And when you breathe out that CO2, uh, you breathe off the byproduct of you buffering all the acids in your body. So you can think of your CO2 as acid leaving the body. That's sort of the way I think of it. And that's not exactly right, but it's close enough for what we're doing. Um, you can make that happen pretty quickly. You can affect somebody's uh, pH really fast by using, um, by using your lungs to blow off their CO2, uh, which drives the pH up generally speaking, makes you less acidotic. Think of CO2 as, as the acid. Uh, your kidneys also can help do it, but that takes a couple of days to actually happen. So lungs blow off CO2, kidneys make bicarbonate, your body's constantly making acid. Let's go back to this, uh, to this picture real quick. So again, we have a young guy, he's intubated, his GCS is three, um, and he is bleeding a lot. He's hypotensive, he's tachycardic, uh, but his SAT is okay. And again, his end tidal CO2 is 11. You look at that and you say, hmm, what's going on? Well, there's really two pictures that might be happening with the patient's acid-base balance right now. Uh, and this is a little bit technical, but stick with me for just a second, we'll get through it. Two things that could be happening. One, you intubated him and you're breathing too fast. And so you've blown, we say blow down your CO2. He has a normal bicarbonate, a normal lactate, and a high pH now. And yes, you wouldn't want that guy to be sitting that way uh, for a long time. If you intubated him for, uh, you know, airway protection or something like that, or you intubated him for a procedure or something like that, and you got uh, a CO2 of 11, then yeah, it's probably safe to say, oh man, I'm breathing way too fast. I need to slow down my squeezies and things will get better. The problem is in this guy and in most of our field patients, we don't entirely know all the rest of these numbers. And so what you may get is, yeah, we see his CO2 is 11, but his CO2 is 11 because he's been breathing uh, at 30 times a minute for the last 20 minutes, desperately trying to blow out all the CO2 that he can. Uh, because he's getting acidotic, because he's in shock, uh, and because he has terrible perfusion, is because he's basically turned into an anaerobic organism at that point. Um, his body is trying to compensate for this acidemia. And so if you uh, then try to raise his CO2, raise his acid again by slowing down his breathing with either paralytics or, you know, a tons of drugs or something like that, his pH goes from a marginal 7.01, which is still pretty bad, down to a non-survivable 6.5 in the matter of a couple of minutes. And this guy uh, dies. And that's, that's what happens. This has been done many, many, many a time uh, by junior residents who uh, see somebody relatively sick and they say, all right, intubate, RSI, paralytics, uh, all right, sedate him. And wow, his respiratory is really high. His anti or CO2 is uh, really low. Let's slow that back down. Let's tinker this. And the guy goes into cardiac arrest. Uh, this is a really important thing. Now, if you just tuned out to everything that I said over the last like five minutes or so, that's fine. Um, but remember this, here's the pearl. It is, as Hinckley would say, it's usually okay to fix a high end tidal CO2. And that's almost always okay to breathe a little bit faster or something like that, uh, except in really bad COPD, in which case we got to talk about other vent stuff, but it's usually okay to try to fix a high end tidal CO2. You have to be extremely careful about trying to fix a low end tidal CO2. So uh, do that with, uh, with extreme caution. Um, and if the patient is breathing one way or another, try to match what the patient was doing or is doing. All right. <clears throat> We should use uh, end tidal CO2 monitoring for every cardiac arrest. Of course, we're probably gonna be putting advanced airways or at least a face mask on people, but we should be using it for every arrest. Pardon me for that. 
Um, and again, this is not just if they have a king in place or if they have an IGL in place, although you certainly should use it there to make sure the thing is seated correctly and exchanging gas, but you can use it uh, on a face mask. It shows that you're getting a good seal and can monitor the quality of CO2, or sorry, the monitor the quality of compressions. How's it technically doing that? Well, it's supposed to be if you are respiring, if you're getting blood flowing past the lungs into the rest of the body, you're making CO2 and that CO2 is coming back out the top of the tube. So if you're not squeezing hard enough on the chest or if you're not doing effective uh, chest compressions, then that CO2 might be low. If it all of a sudden gets really high, then we have reason to think that maybe the patient has attained ROS because now they're flowing a whole lot better. So kind of know what that's about. Uh, I've honestly, to be perfectly honest, I don't know if this is super useful or not, except if their entitled CO2 suddenly goes from 20 to uh, 60, that's something I may kind of watch out for. But uh, use it for every cardiac arrest, absolutely. Even if you don't have an advanced air in place, you can do it just on a, uh, on a bag. That is, uh, that is fine. We're almost to the end. Remember that it's never the machine. It's never the machine's fault uh, that there is no entitled CO2 waveform. I will not soon forget that I had a patient that was brought into us in cardiac arrest. Uh, it was after a drowning, I recall. <clears throat> um, and the uh, paramedics had used entitled CO2 monitoring. They had in fact taken one entitled CO2 lens, thrown it away and gotten another one out. And the reason was they didn't think it was working uh, because it was getting too full of vomit. Think about that. The entitled CO2 is not working because it's too full of vomit. And we think that's why it's not giving us a waveform. It's a real story. And, and you know, in retrospect, I can see where they're coming from. Like, oh man, there's a bunch of crap in there. Um, but nobody recognized that it's full of vomit because you're actually ventilating his stomach. Um, <clears throat> again, real thing. You can never afford to say the cap knows not working, throw it away. Uh, we'll, we'll just go with it. What we got, you have to show that it's in the right spot. Uh, otherwise you have no idea about tube placement. Uh, and again, even our best look, uh, with our eyes is not a hundred percent. So you cannot afford to say that it's not the, that it's the machine that's not working. As long as you have blood flowing past your alveoli in one way or another, uh, you are going to get CO2 coming back out. There's really only a couple of cases where that might not happen. Uh, one would be if you have a huge blood clot in your lungs, uh, which obstructs all blood flow to your lungs and literally blood can't get past the alveoli. Uh, or if you have something like this, tamponade, where literally no blood is flowing out of your heart because it's all squished uh, and the heart is literally not pumping. In that case, you may not really get much of an entitled CO2 wave or anything like that. But those are pretty uncommon uh, and you still will probably get some degree of uh, entitled CO2 coming out the end. And of course, um, the third reason that you're not getting entitled CO2 is that the tube's in the wrong spot. And again, I see the cords, right? You see the cords. That's a grade one view, except it's a grade one view of the esophageal inlet. The cords are actually up here. So we can all be fooled uh, by what we see with our eyes. That's why the objective entitled CO2 monitoring is so much better. Uh, there's some other stuff you can do with it, and I'll just buzz, uh, buzz kind of past this real quick. You can measure entitled CO2 on a patient in the nasal cannula. Certainly, you can put a, uh, a mask over top of that nasal cannula and still get a relatively accurate uh, entitled CO2 measurement uh, as well. You know, if you're blowing air out past it, if it's not just passively, if you're blowing air out past it, uh, you're, it's still going to pick up that, uh, um, <clears throat> that CO2 measurement. Let's look at this case real quick, some other stuff you might be able to do. And again, this is for the EMTs in the room. Uh, how do you really want to, you know, how do you, how do you really show somebody up? Well, uh, let's say we have grandma. Grandma's a diabetic. We know that we make a million runs a, a year to grandma's house uh, because she's got low blood sugar. We find her today and she looks a little different. She's kind of tacky. She's a little bit altered. Um, <clears throat> Blood pressure is a little on the soft side. She's sat in okay, but her entitled CO2 is low and she's breathing fairly quickly. Hmm, what's going on here? Uh, and then somebody checks a finger stick and finds it to be greater than 600. What's the diagnosis we've got? So we've got somebody with a, she's breathing spontaneously. She is a little tachycardic, a little unstable, and her entitled CO2 is low. So she has a low amount of acid. Uh, she is trying to blow off acid, essentially. You can make this diagnosis and say, I'm pretty sure this lady is in DKA. Now, you're not going to give her insulin or something like that. But what have you got? You've got a patient who's acidotic, 
and she's trying to compensate for it by breathing quickly and blowing out all that CO2. Um, the acid, by the way, in DKA is made by uh, things other than CO2, so that's, that's why you would uh, effectively try to blow that number down, uh, and her blood sugar's high. So she's got the acidosis, she's got the elevated blood sugar, she's probably got ketones in there someplace, almost certainly. Um, <clears throat> you can make uh, with your tools, you know, just as, as a BLS or uh, advanced EMT, in, in depending on what state you're on, with just your tools available, you can uh, make the diagnosis of DKA right out there in the field. Now, again, can you do a whole lot about it? Mm, fluid. Uh, you can make sure that you don't try to intubate this person or slow her breathing rate down, because if you do, she'll die. Uh, but that's something you can do. Let's take another case, really similar looking monitor. In this case, grandma is an 88 year old lady that came from the nursing home. Uh, she was normal last night uh, and this morning, uh, this morning nurses found her uh, coughing a lot. And uh, when you see her, her sat's still okay, but she's coughing up a ton of yellow stuff and she feels hot to you. You get basically the same measurements. What do we see? A low end tidal CO2, but her breathing spontaneously. She's probably trying to blow off all that acid. Uh, this in many of our uh, mind, we've got somebody that's got a source of infection. We've got somebody that's a little hypotensive. We've got somebody that is uh, blowing off their CO2, so they're probably acidotic. Uh, this is someone that's probably in sepsis, maybe, maybe fairly significant sepsis. Uh, and again, it takes a little bit of knowledge to kind of do that and a little bit of thought process behind it. But you can definitely say, this is a septic person. I'm going to call and say, hey, hospital, I'm bringing you a septic old lady. Uh, she needs flu. We're giving her the uh, 30, we're starting the 30 ml per kilo bolus of fluid or whatever it is that you're going to give her. And um, uh, be ready for us because she's, she's fairly sick. And I know that because X, Y, and Z, but entitled CO2 monitoring as part of that. I only mean to say that, uh, not that you have to make these diagnoses, although you probably should, but uh, you can with just what you have in the field. <clears throat> the last thing I will say uh, on this uh, setting as well is if you are given anybody medicine that may make their breathing a little slower, pain medicine, uh, sedative medicine, excited delirium has come up as a thing here recently. How do you know these patients continue to breathe um, after you've given them their ketamine or their Versed or whatever it is that you're going to give them? We use this a lot for procedural sedation um, <clears throat> in, in the ED, and one of the big problems you worry about is, is the person going to continue to spontaneously breathe? The best way to tell a person is breathing is to use end tidal CO2 monitoring because it is the first and the only, early, nah, earliest detection about whether or not uh, they are going to continue to uh, breathe. Now, <clears throat> um, you can hold your breath. As I mentioned, that the, the young man at the beginning um, who was paralyzed and uh, extubated for some time, but yet maintained his sat. He had a, he had a sat probe on. Uh, maintained his sat just fine. Um, you can do that, uh, as a matter of fact. Your end tidal CO2, when you stop breathing, immediately falls off because there's no breath coming past it. Your sat may stay up for minutes, 10, 20 minutes sometimes. And if you're on supplemental oxygen, 40 minutes. Uh, as an example, here is one handsome gentleman, one late night, who said, uh, let's see what happens here. So I'm getting myself psyched up. I'm holding my breath. I'm just going to go away here for a second. Holding, holding, holding. Still holding my breath. Still holding my breath. You notice the sat probe uh, still functional. Still satting 99%. Heart rate's okay. I've been apneic for like 30 seconds now. Continue to be apneic. Sat still 99. Continue to be apneic. Sat still 99. Oh. Uh, oh. Down, down a point. Still apneic. Still apneic. Now, I'm getting fairly uncomfortable because my CO2 is climbing, heart rate's coming up a little bit, but my SAT is staying just fine. Still apneic, by the way. Really uncomfortable by this point, but still maintaining my SAT just fine. All right, so lots of people can hold their breath longer than that, but I was happening for more than a minute and my sat never moved. Heart rate went up a little bit. It was super distressing. Um, 
but we would not have known that I was extubated or that I was apneic uh, for that whole time period until my sat dropped, you know, six, seven minutes later and actually got down to a, a low number where it actually fell off the edge of the curb. I may have been apneic for 10 minutes. Um, and, but if we'd had end tidal CO2 on me, you would have known right away that I wasn't breathing. <clears throat> Lastly, I will just tell you if you're going to use end tidal CO2 monitoring, and you absolutely should, you need to know your equipment. Um, again, you can use end tidal CO2 underneath a uh, mask in a spontaneously breathing patient. It may, the number may not be exactly the same, but it's going to be darn close, and you're still going to get a waveform. You may have heard of apneic oxygenation, uh, where before we are going to intubate folks, we're going to put an end tidal, or we're going to put a nasal cannula on uh, on these guys, and then crank it up to you know 15, 20, as basically as high as the regulator goes. Um, <clears throat> You may have seen that described. Uh, the thing is that you have to be very careful about it because you may think, oh, I wanna use end tidal CO2 monitoring at the same time. The problem is not every end tidal CO2 nasal cannula works the same. So the apneic oxygenation relies on you to have two prongs in your nose uh, that are basically injecting oxygen back into your posterior pharynx. Um, most of your end tidal CO2 monitoring cannulae are gonna be a little bit different. So you may see one like this where it's split and one side picks up CO2 and I just realized I'm not here anymore and you can't see what I'm doing. One side picks up CO2, the other side uh, just delivers oxygen. So you're only getting you know, maybe 50% of the flow at that point. You have to know about that. Some, some of these have like kind of broken up lumens uh, that deliver oxygen to both sides but at half the diameter that you normally would. Um, so be aware of that. Most of the time, most of our nasal cannulas, though, that we have, keep in mind uh, that <clears throat> they don't actually inject oxygen into the nose. The little prongs that are there are sensor prongs, uh, which is why they're so small. So they are picking up CO2, but they are actually, uh, if you look at the nasal cannula itself, down at the hub, this, this part right here, this is the part that actually just uh, blows oxygen out and it blows oxygen at your nose, but not like deep into your nose or something like that. So it's important to keep that in mind. If you're not getting good oxygen saturation with, uh, with an entitled CO2 monitor like this, it may be because you're not actually providing like a lot of oxygen or if they can't breathe through their nose, you're not injecting oxygen back into it. Um, <clears throat> one last thing to mention, you still can keep oxygen on somebody even if they're wearing a NEB mask as well, uh, and entitled CO2 monitoring will work in that same, uh, in that same way. Let's get past this stuff because I talked way too much, but I think it's important. Um, <clears throat> in summary, entitled CO2, waveform entitled CO2 goes on every tube, every time. Uh, everything you stick on the patient's mouth or every time you breathe through needs to have an entitled CO2 waveform monitor at the end of it. And if the tube, uh, if there's no waveform, the tube is bad in one way or another until you can absolutely prove otherwise. And you can't afford to say that, uh, that it's the machine. <coughs> CO2 can be a vital sign. It probably should be a vital sign, at least in all of our intubated patients. Um, but, uh, but we can use it as well to make a lot of interesting uh, medical decisions. <clears throat> Remember, again, as I said, it is never the device that fails. It is the tube that is bad until you can prove that the tube is not bad, which is very hard to do because you're going to use entitled CO2 to do it. But it is never the device. It is always the tube that is malfunctioning, and you have to fix the tube as your first priority. <clears throat> Remember, too, uh, that it is usually okay to try to fix a high end tidal CO2. It may be very dangerous to try to fix a low end tidal CO2, so be mindful of that and don't monkey around too much with it uh, unless you really know what you're doing and you have a lot of information like a blood gas where you can make those decisions. That's entitled CO2. 